Welcome Susan, Joe, and Philip. Hi. Hi. At HL Studios. Tell us about what's been going on since the gig in Brighton. What you've been up to? Absolutely nothing. Right. <laughs> we did. We weren't really. Well, we did quite a lot of work last year, right. and uh, we make money so that we can not do anything if we don't want. To. So, <laughs> so last we've done year was a busy, a busy year. So on on the road. Yeah. Touring we, Australia. Yeah. America. We did um, four weeks on our own in America, going right from coast to coast, which was hard work but quite enjoyable and it was good to be able to go over there and knew that know that we could fill places out without being on you know just on our own sort of thing with no one else with us um and then we went to australia for two weeks but that was in a package thing we were heading the bill but we did two weeks in australia and then who else was on it Howard jones that kind no. of no kim kim, kim wilde belinda, belinda carlisle, carlisle. Paul Young, Go, Go West. Um, a couple of Australian bands were yes, on. Yeah, on. there was someone How else. How long did you get on stage for that? Paul, oh, Paul, Paul Young. Paul Young. Well, we did, for, did we do 40, 40, 40 minutes, minutes, 45 minutes yeah. right. or something? Yeah, that's good. I mean, most groups only do like three numbers. Right. Like most groups go, and it's a bit like a factory thing you know they go on they have they all have a house band we take our own band so there's quite a bit of a gap and a changeover right. we have our own stage set and everything right. um and most groups only go on and do three numbers so, mm -hmm. so 45 minutes is quite a long set in that concept well it yeah. sort of builds up doesn't it yeah. it's like starts off with people doing two numbers and yeah. kim wilde was on before us and i think she did about 30 minutes yes. didn't she? and right. then we did right. 40. Now the next question on the UK tour that was in December that was at Brighton, that was the last night, you, you played Sheffield, is it always quite emotional playing Sheffield City Hall? It's horrible, well, we, don't, it? we don't like playing our hometown, there's too many people that we know in the audience and it's it's just a bit nerve wracking really and we always wish that we could leave it out but I think we're going to. Really? <laughs> we say that every year. Well, no, but the city hall's closing down. The, the place where everyone plays is actually closing down for refurbishment in a couple of months. I thought, I thought it had already closed down, but they were carrying on doing concerts. I got really confused. I got very confused, but yeah. it's horrible because you sort of... Because of what we do, when you're actually on stage, it's a, bit, it's a little bit like acting you're not yourself it's not the way that you normally are when you go out and things and i think you feel slightly embarrassed about actually doing your job when you're at home because you know that everyone's going to see you down the supermarket or in the local restaurant or something and you actually i don't think we actually ever give a really good performance here because we we sort of can't let ourselves go whereas everywhere else we just don't care and for that UK tour, Phil, when you were sort of putting together the set list, is that always a, an argumentative thing or are you quite happy with the, the numbers? Would some of you like more balance from the older stuff? And uh, I don't know, it just sort of happens, doesn't it? We put, we, we put everything on little cards and we move them, move them around. Right. I don't like ballads, but we have to do human. Really, we're a dance band, you know, we, we succeeded always. With, with dance material of the time, so we always try and push it in in that direction. Right. It was hard this year because we we had to rehearse the short set for Australia yeah. and the long set for Britain together before we went and get two different modes in our head, mm -hmm. which which was a little bit difficult. Right. But when we always rehearse a lot more than we end up doing, even though we do, I think last December we did about an hour and 20 minutes set right. but when we rehearse we rehearse about two and a half hours worth of stuff right. and then and we know right from the beginning what we're gonna leave out so I don't really know why well, we have to rehearse it but we try we always try and give because we we tour Britain quite a lot we always try to give them different a few different songs mm -hmm. but w it's quite difficult for us because we've got so many hits that people are expecting to listen to mm -hmm. that we can't really take any of those out. So all that happens is the set gets longer and longer and really we're on stage for too long and you don't want to bore people. Yeah. You know, I think when groups say that they play for two, two and a half hours, I think that's a hideous idea because I think the audience must be bored mm -hmm. to death. 
Uh, I, think I like a good 20 minutes. <laughs> 20 minutes. Yeah, the, oh. the first 20 minutes is the best part yeah. of a show, isn't it? And, then, and, then and you also, on the set list at Brighton, you did have two numbers from your very latest album. That's All I Ever Wanted and... Uh, Love me madly. We yeah. did, did we only do two from Secrets? I thought no, we did three from Secrets. We did, we did from three secrets. from Secrets. Would, would you have liked to have done more? Sort of plugging the current thing. But it's not current anymore. No. I think we did... Latest, we, then. We did that... Um, the two years before when the album actually came out it's and we did a lot of stuff from that album right yeah. and now it's sort of drifted back to doing more things that were bigger hits really right although although they're, they're, in, in some ways that is still current because Michael's just done the remix of Love Me, of Love Me Madly yeah. which is, is released over, over Benelux Right. And there's all these little things going off. Now that now the music industry is, is a lot of little small things instead of a few big things. Right. There's, like we, we do better with remixes than we do with the original albums or singles, <laughs> which is getting really strange. Yeah. Now you've had artists like Moby who sort of tipped their hat to you and very grateful for what you've done. Do you feel like the kind of the, the people who started off the whole synth pop thing? And I don't know. I, th I mean, we like it when people say that they've been influenced by us and things like that, but I don't know. Well, that... Maybe we were the first synth pop. We, we were the first one to make it continuous. Right. Although, although I would say the thing that makes us different is that we had an album. I, I was wondering that in Australia. We play Australia and uh, Kim Wilde was really bigger than us. Yeah. Belinda was really bigger than us, but, but we headed the bill. I think that's maybe because uh, to some level, we, we are thought of as an album band and not a right. single band. Right. And just heading back from Secrets, which was in 2001, um, when you did the Octopus album, what happened in between there? Were you sort of, when you were sort of putting the, the current album two years ago together, were you thinking in terms of, right, well, we're going to make this like a kind of summary of everything that we've done or we want to move it forward. What was behind Secrets in terms of material? Well, the, yeah, Secrets was supposed to cover the whole period. We were very pleased with Octopus and it saved our lives, right. really. Be between Ian Stanley nice. and, and Max Hull, the guys at East West who believed in us when really we'd had a, we'd had a terribly bad time for five mm -hmm. or six years before that. And, and the, that's the reason we're still here, the reason we can play live, the reason why people sample us or use, use loops from us. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't exactly a Human League album. It right. was very much sort of an Ian Stanley sort of stroke, <laughs> Tears for fears -y sort of album. Right. So with Secrets, we wanted to take the opportunity to do a really synthy, straightforward Human League album. Because, right. you know, I know I really, we know what we've always been. We've always been more or less quite simple and direct. And so we avoided things like key changes and clever chords and, and, and harmonies, harmonies and stuff and just tried to get back to, to what we thought we are. Right. That's why there were quite a lot of little instrumentals on Secrets because, you know, what before Joanne and I had joined, what the, the original Human League started out as, you know, they, mm -hmm. they, it was all about the instrumentation and not right. always about the songs or the vocals at that stage. Right. So we wanted to show people that we were still capable of doing that, that we didn't just, we didn't just make sort of pop records. Mm -hmm. Around the time of Boys and Girls heading straight back now, uh, there was one, one article where you were heading down with Adrian to London for a meeting Phil with uh, Virgin and Martin Rushton, and your objective was going to be you wanted Dare to be an album without drums. It was going to be just vocal and synth, and they persuaded you if you want to make money, it's got to have drums on it. Was that a big decision to actually sort of get, go away from the strictly vocals and synth approach? Well, I mean, we just didn't do it. We did what we wanted in the end. But I mean, we worked that out ages and ages ago, and. and if, when people tell us to do things or ask us to do things, we always say, yeah, we'll do exactly what you want, certainly. And then we go away and do what we want. Right, right. You know. And, and you know, there was, it was a totally synthetic album. We used a drum machine, but there, there, were, there were no guitars, nothing played on it, and that was the thing, really. But using drum, a drum machine wasn't a big deal for you. You were quite happy to do it if, if they thought it would sort of sell more records. 
the, the argument wasn't about that actually. The argument wasn't about using the drum machine. It was about guitars. Yeah. The actual argument with Virgin was you you cannot put this album out without putting guitars on it. And we just said no. They, you know, you have to have some sort of drum. You have to have a beat going. And it was always, you know, we were going to use the Lind drum. It was always the thing that we used. Yeah. Um, but it was the argument with the record company was certainly about guitars, and we just said no, and we didn't do it. Oh. And and they just, I think they were just happy with the album. Oh well, well, certainly happy with the singles that we brought out that eventually became the album. Right. That must have been a funny little period when that argument came up because I'm amazed that we didn't have the power to just just ignore them anyway. But we it, did ignore them anyway. <laughs> it must have been when, when Open Your Heart came out because everyone thought it would do better than Love Action and it didn't, did yes, it? Yes, that's right. And it must have been, everyone must have thought we were slipping, the graph was going in the wrong direction. Right. But then we did, when we did Don't You Want Me After That. Right. And uh, when you actually did Dare, it was an album that started to take shape as a result of the three singles, yeah? Uh, in those days you didn't have to, ju you didn't make an album and then pick singles mm. from it, you did the exact opposite. So we made Sound of the Crowd and we put it out, right. we made Love Action, we put it out, and then by the time we'd finished, by the time Open Your Heart came out, the album was finished then, wasn't it? And that's right. why we didn't want to release Don't You Want Me because we'd already had three singles from the album. Mm -hmm. And we thought, well, and obviously the album was doing really, really well. And we thought no one's going to want to buy another single because they've all bought the album. Right. So right. that's why we tried really hard to stop them from putting Don't You Want Me out. And Sound of the Crowd, that was definitely a dance single, wasn't it? That was, yeah. yeah. That was, you had your Human League Red label and that yeah. was, that was going to be definitely a dancing. And Ian started that as a bass Baseline, is that right? I think he did. Yeah. I think he did, yeah. Uh, uh, that was really Ian's song. I did a few little bits on it. Right, yeah. right. And um, after the hit singles and the album comes out, were you amazed, overwhelmed by five million copies? Did it overwhelm you? Did it change you as people? I don't think we thought about Did we think about it? I think we were very busy at the time, weren't we? Oh, it was terrible, it was, yeah. We didn't really have a minute to sort of sit down and take a breath. Right. We were just sort of like on and off buses and aeroplanes and just virtually spent just, no time. Literally, home. you just out of school, weren't you? You you just done your A levels, hadn't you? Yes. So it was a story that you you did top of the pops and you had to rush back up north yeah, to, to right. take an extra in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> it's so different. And was it worth it? It's so <laughs> it's so different now because everyone's so. You see, we were quite disappointed when Don't You Want Me went to number one, which I don't think anyone can understand. But what it meant to us was that every other record, unless it equaled that, would be a disappointment because it wouldn't get there. And we'd like it better, you know, when all the others went to, when they went to number three or something, that was better because it still gave you something to aim for. Whereas now, if you have a record, with a lot of groups, if you have a record that doesn't go in at number one, you get dropped by your record company. It's such an oh. alien concept. Well, you, you're Where not is having, there to go? You're not yeah. having a hit when you're number 11. Yeah, yeah. that's... Well, hello, yeah. I think getting to number 11 is having a hit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's, but it's so different now. But at the time, I don't think we thought about... The only reason to think about selling that many records was it enabled us to go and work in a studio in London that we wanted to work in with the producer that we wanted to work with right. and that the only w way we could d do that was because we'd sold that many records mm -hmm. and the record company were prepared to spend our money for us and right. do that. Right. <laughs> yeah. And when it came to hysteria um, he resigned halfway through didn't he? No, I don't think we, that. I think he's resigned way before. I think we went down we, to Reddit. We lost Martin. Yeah, right. At, um, fascination. When when he did the yeah. mixes on Fascination. Oh, that's right. And he, he suddenly went into strange, I can't make a decision. Because you when you've had a lot of success and you've got everybody saying to you, right, we need a hit, we need a hit, we need a hit. And so instead of doing a Martin Russian mix and coming in and going, right, I've done this fantastic mix, listen to it, he came in and said, I've done these six mixes, we're going to have to sit down and pick which is the best. Probably not six, but... I can't, I can't remember, it was either seven or eleven, I can't remember. And, because he and did then, the whole version so, with you singing it all, didn't So we you? were all then sat in a the studio trying, thinking, well, the idea was that 
every people were going to be singing different lines and it, there was all these different mixes and we just ended up having a big row with him. Was it about the vocal? The vocal it was supposed mix. to be like it was supposed to be like Prince's 1999. That was the idea. The yeah. idea was that that Prince had done that song called 1999, where he got all his band to sing lines right. in the verse, which you know we thought was a great idea. So we all did, we all sang the whole song and just pieced it together. But then he just got this thing that we couldn't have a song that Philip didn't sing. All the lead yeah. vocal, even though we jabbed "Don't You Want Me," <laughs> it was a can't. But, it, but I think that what happens is when you get success, you suddenly doubt your, you doubt your talent, or you doubt that you think that it was luck. That's what you think, and you suddenly think you can't. You haven't got the capability to carry it through again. Well, some of the problem was was that technology had moved on. The the even while we made Dare, it was very very hard to do what we did. They hadn't invented. Well, the Lindrum really is a sampler, mm -hmm. and that the samplers were very primitive to use them at all it was very hard. And just in the intervening time, the Fairlight and the Synclavia yeah. had come out, and it meant there were more possibilities. And you know, it, we, we were lurching into that period, which, which everyone had, where people were suddenly going, "Is the fourteenth hi hat on bar thirty-eight good enough?" Mm -hmm. Because you could go down to that detail, and people had the possibility, but hadn't had it long enough to say, well, we've got to forget that detail and get on with the important point. Right. And we all got, we all got stuck in it. I'm sure Martin got stuck in it, and he used to let the machines make the decisions instead of him making the decisions. But then we did exactly the same thing. We walked in to make the album without Martin and, and spent a couple of weeks trying to do the first bass drum. And Joe, as you were saying, when it got to, when Hysteria got to number three, only number three, was, was there pressure from the, the record company where they're suddenly saying, you know, this band's on the slide? Or well, Virgin were really still a load of old hit weren't they? <laughs> they didn't they, care at that time. They Honestly, it was like, it was a success after, you know, we'd spent all that time and to them and to us, it was a success. Mm -hmm. and, and they were, you know, they weren't rushing us to make it or anything. I'd say it was much right. more significant, but didn't they have the Culture Club by then? Who, who more or less eclipsed us. And they, they didn't care what we were doing because Culture Club were coming out with number ones. Right. Really. They, they took an overview of the, of the whole record company and the record company was doing fine. Right. It was a different time. You can't compare it at all to how it is now. Three was a great success, wasn't it? You know, we yeah. were all yeah. And why the big change of direction then with Crash? Who was behind that? <laughs> Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. We had no, we went into the studio to start recording Crash. There'd, there'd become a lot of tensions within the group. Certain people were writing songs that were just not good enough to put on a record, but no one really could say anything. We were not having a good time. We started recording it with a different producer that it was blatantly not working at all and we I mean if we were just finished really at that stage I think we thought we were finished I think there was too much going on that we couldn't concentrate on what we were actually there why mm. we were there in the first place mm. and we just I think just us and Ian sat with Simon Draper at Virgie or maybe it was just the three of us and Simon said who do you want to work with if you could have anybody who would you like to work with and we'd all been listening to Jam and Lewis in a group called Change. And we said, well, we really like Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. Thinking, well, we like Change, but Adrian liked the SOS band yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. He thought that was that, that Just Be Good To Me was the best single. Mm -hmm. and, and we, time, which it probably was. And we just thought, they're never going to work with a group of bozos from Sheffield. And, you know, they've worked with some of the best singers in the world and stuff. And they're, they're sort of funky and they're proper sort of... R and B yeah. and we just like a little synthy pop group. And Simon went to them and they said, Yeah, great, we love they love fascination. And they said, Yeah, come over, we'll And they wanted to write the next Don't You Want Me. Right. Which that was human. human. Yeah, yeah. Did you have any of the material yet for Octopus? Oh god. Oh wow. yeah. Yeah, we Oh yeah, three or four of the tracks that ended up on Octopus. That's right. Was it? They yeah, heard yeah, yeah, demos. Yeah, that's yeah, I thought right. I read that they heard yeah. Tell, yes. me when, uh, tell me when it and was. rejected it. Is that right? I, th yeah, tell oh, I think, I think, tell, me when I think yeah. tell me when and one man and were certainly on that tape. Yeah. 
and I think there was something else, but I can't remember what. But oh. it's then we had the thing in um, America with people saying to, you know, not liking Don't You Want Me and saying we were, oh, it's that guy who wanted us to have dancers on a TV show. And we said, no, we don't have dancers. We're going a different slot in the, on the TV show. Anything like that, we're prepared to make a compromise, but not a compromise of having dancers. Mm -hmm. And he just said, well, you're finished. You know, you will not do anything in this country. And I think it was three weeks later, num it was number one. All right. It's... So the times were very much changing and, and people were trying to tell you what to do, basically, is that... No, I think they just I sort of abandoned us. I think we didn't in fit in. It was it's it's really really simple. And to be truthful, if I'd have been Virgie, I'd have done exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. We didn't fit in. Everyone was listening to grunge. It was when Nirvana were really big. Yeah. There were no sort of glamorous pop stars really. No one making sort of pop, not really making pop ditties, apart from maybe the whatever boy bands were about mm -hmm. at that stage, sort of thing. But, but the rave and dance thing, that was by the 90s, by the early mid 90s, that had taken hold of the nation, hadn't it? Yeah. That was what's, no, it was that coming in that, that made us acceptable again. I think that, that we were inevitably going to look very unfashionable because we'd been so fashionable. And because our sound, we never did a scattergun approach of, of, of sort of let's blend, let's have a bit of everything and try and appeal to everyone. We were very specific. We were, uh -huh. we were the bleep, bleepy synth band yeah. and that just went out right. uh, and it, it took the the rave people coming back and saying actually that's just another part of, of the instrumentation that people can make interesting records with mm -hmm. and everyone went oh yeah synths aren't, aren't horrible are they they're just another instrument right. oh and who did those humanly yeah they're all right and we started fading back in at that point around I the mid 90s with octopus yeah abso absolutely i think that that the I first wave was this, for that we got signed by east west in 94 i think yeah oh uh, but and we and strangely through having after being dropped in 1990 we'd had four years completely in the wilderness not really knowing what to do and and then all of a sudden our, our solicitor said because we didn't have a manager at the time we had nothing and um solicitor said come on this is silly you've got mm. some songs let i'm going to make some appointments for you and some record companies and we're like oh we're not prepared for this steve and we can't do this right. and and he's so we started going and meeting people and for the first time in in years people were actually being nice to us and saying nice things and not just having a meeting and set a few people had meetings and then we never heard from them but there were lots of follow-up meetings and so we were that close to signing with sony which i think in retrospect would have been a mistake but i suppose you don't know uh -huh. i think we might have got lost amongst everyone yeah, else yeah i thought but we, I, we met muff winwood a few times yeah it was great really. and, and you know there were you know all of a sudden they they wanted to sign us they were putting contracts and it was like wow this we can't quite believe this is going to happen and then East West also took that a step further with backing us on the touring side, mm -hmm. which Virgin had not done since the early eight. Uh, well, no, since 1986. Mm -hmm. And they just, all we've been told was, you can't tour. You're not a touring band. People don't want to see you. I, I got a romantic, especially was the case there, where they, they wouldn't support you. No, too. not at all. So, right. They didn't have anything to do with us. They, we was, we were something like six years without an A&R visit <laughs> and eventually someone rang up and, uh, and, and, and someone in A&R said well they're too big we can't A&R them we thought, and we were up here feeling very lonely thinking we need some support yeah. and I, th I think they fell apart <coughs> at the same time we fell apart yeah. just that sort of casting your minds back over all that period Susan I read somewhere you said that the 80s you hated the 80s there was nothing good about the 80s do you, do you still feel that way about them? yeah I mean, I suppose the only good thing that came out of the 80s for me, really, was being joining the group, which, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really take away now for anything because it, it's been my whole adult life. And, you know, as years have gone on, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. But I didn't start enjoying being in this group until 1995. And that's not, it's not a lie. I had a horrible time and I just didn't like it. Yeah, I, I didn't feel exactly the I same. I didn't I, understand it. I didn't know why we, were do, why we were there. I couldn't, 
because I'd never wanted to be famous and I'd never wanted to be in a pop group, I couldn't understand. And also that pop music's supposed to be a very small period of time. You're supposed to only do it for five years. And sort of, I'd been doing it for 14 years and I couldn't understand why I was still there. And what, you know, what have we done to still be there? And it's about time I got a proper job and did what normal people did. Well, when Phil spotted you way back in 1980 at the Daisy Discotheque in Sheffield, you were both A-level students. How did you, Joe? how did you see your life mapping out, if you could, at that point? What, what were you sort of hoping to do at uni and what kind of... Well, we both got places at university, reliant on obviously A level results, which we ended up failing because we well, didn't. Right. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> because of joining the group. But um, we we just wanted to really get out of Sheffield, didn't we? We didn't want to go to a university in Sheffield. We wanted to leave home and go to a university in London or we Manchester. We do arts type things or sciences. What do well, you... I was going to do psychology and sociology, and I was just doing business studies because I didn't know what else to do. And, you know, we've not got anything mapped out further than that. Sort of escaping from Sheffield, going to university, because then you used to get grants and you could just sort of drink a lot and not do very much well, at university. we just university. didn't want to go to work, did we? We yeah. didn't want to get a job. Who would? It was that simple. It was like, at, at, at 17, 18, I, I think you're too young to make a life decision. Yeah. And we certainly weren't going to do that. But when Phil asked you to go to Germany, was it that yes. short? How, that must have been pretty bizarre. One minute to be at school and next minute to be on stage with this group that's already got two albums out. Well, it didn't actually seem like that. It just sort of sent a bit like an extension of going out clubbing because we just had a completely mad time on those six weeks, didn't we? We just... Yeah. It, it was completely mad. We got on the ferry, got drunk and sobered up when we came home six weeks later without barely phoning our parents, which they were pulling the hair out about because one of the conditions of being able to go was that we phoned home every other day or something. So um, your, your dad's a pistol shooting champion. It was, so that's a very long time ago. My dad doesn't have guns anymore, he's not allowed. My but Phil, do you anymore. remember some heavy threats from oh, yeah. Susan's dad? Well, it's, only, it's only reasonable, really. <laughs> he did say if, any, if, anything, if anything happened. To, to, I don't know if it was to both of you or just to Susan, he, he would shoot us. <laughs> <laughs> so suddenly, one minute you're A-level students, one autumn, and next minute you're on stage in Germany. That's quite a culture shock, isn't it? Well, it wasn't for us because we were very used to going out clubbing. We used to go out, what, about four times a week? And it was sort of a bit of an extension of that. We had a really mad six weeks because... Well, I don't know. I mean, I know you took your music seriously, but it was all a bit of a laugh as well, wasn't it, then? Well, there was no money involved, was no, there? It, no, it, no one had any money. So we was... were literally, we were in a transit van, staying yeah. in little cheap hotels, having to share room. You know, all the lads were sharing rooms and stuff, mm -hmm. and we were sharing, and it wasn't, it wasn't what, well, it was just like a group of people having a bit of a laugh and, like you say, singing a few songs and stuff. And I think they Did you see it as a one-off thing for that tour at that point? Yeah. You'll be back to your studies and it yeah. was just a nice... We never ever asked us to join the group. He only ever asked us to go on the tour with them. I mean, we weren't... Susan and I weren't well-liked on that tour. It was a, a sort of tour of German army bases and the people that came were expecting an all-male band and they weren't best pleased when they saw me and Susan. And we did get various things thrown at us while we were on the stage. Lots of really? Full cans of lager. Oh, yes. That was a good one. You just got used to it after a bit. So, no. so when you returned from Germany, you, you saw it, you were back to your studies and it's going to be a new university as you, you thought it would be. Yeah, I don't, and then we all got on really well on the tour. And so we all started going out together, you know, like as a group of mates or... Mm -hmm started sort of going out to like the local cocktail to Max's, Max's, Max's cocktail, cocktail bar. bar. Um, and we, and then, and we'd go down to the studio, like when me and Joanne had finished school, we'd go and get on the bus and go down and see what they were up to and just hang out really. And, and then when they started recording Dare, Philip phoned up and said, did we want to come down to Reading for the mm. day and do a few Was Boys and Girls the first kind of... Human? We didn't sing on we didn't that, sing we were on. just... On the cover, because <laughs> we were hanging around the studio. Right. 
Yeah. And Adrian took the first <coughs> one, didn't he? Yeah. <coughs> so, so, Sound of the Crowd was the first song that was sung. Right. <coughs> and that was your first Top of the Pops experience? Yeah. And then back up on the train to, to take the A-levels again? Not that first time. No. No, we didn't. I think it was when we were doing Love Action that we actually went up to do A-levels. But we did Sound of the Crowd a couple of times on Top of the Pops. Now, last question to the three of you, if I may. All those sort of different kinds of albums, which is the album for each of you that you enjoy, that you like most now looking back? And what was your happiest time in Human League up until the present? I, I, I think really, I suppose we'd all say Secrets probably, isn't it? Because secrets. it's our most current album and I think it's, we'd sort of finally got to something that the Human League is supposed to be. And we were working with people that actually quite understood that, as opposed to people, a lot of the time producers say, oh yeah, 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 I know, I know what you mean, I understand the concept of Human League, but they don't. And this time I think we were working with people that were more sympathetic to it. They actually did, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Susan, what's your... No, that, so... I, I would say secrets, yeah, because mm. I mean, you, you have to look at each differently and you know Dare was really, I, did, I hardly did anything on Dare I spent about two weeks down in Reading doing a few vocals yeah. and stuff and yeah. it really you know although it gave us the success I suppose but I think I mean I, I really like Octopus but I'm, I'm aware that it's not really a total Human League album there's bits in it that we wouldn't have done and I think Secrets is probably, it's the most complete. Was that the producer on Octopus that? I think it, it, was, lot, it was lots of factors. You know, we wanted to, we, we desperately needed a hit record. So, we, you know, I think we compromised a little bit on things that we shouldn't have done. Mm -hmm. But I think Secrets good because it's the most complete and I'm still glad that after doing it for 20 years, or however long, you know, that we can still make what I see as a really modern record that stands up. I know no one bought, I know not very many people bought it, and I know it's the only album that we've ever had that's not had a hit single on it, really. But I still think that if it hadn't have had our name on the front, and, you know, it hadn't have had our picture on the front or something, I think that it would have gone top ten. Mm -hmm. I think a lot more people bought the album than we think. I think it, it's sort of, especially when we went to America, we got a bit of a surprise because we actually thought we knew that it had come out over there, but it had only come out on a really small label, hadn't it? And we thought no one would have heard any of that stuff. And then surprisingly, every night there was quite a lot of people with the CD of Secrets to be oh. signed at the end, oh. wasn't there? Yeah. And that was on Papillon, which is yeah. Chrysalis, you know, and they, yeah. they, went, they went busted then. The week, yeah. the week that the single came out. Yeah. yeah. But the, I thought the album did go top ten anyway. I think In it the first have. week it went to number six, surely, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, are you writing stuff as we speak? Yeah, as we... Nope. No. Anything planned? <laughs> Just, well, we're, we're, we're not on new material, but uh, we've got plans but we tend to sort of have the first six months of the year to um, to ourselves and then spend sort of like the next six months doing live stuff really mm -hmm. for the past few years. And, and the live programme that you had last year, Australia and, and England at the end, you still very much enjoy that kind of lifestyle, do you? It was hard work. Life. I mean, that's why we're not doing anything now as far as I'm concerned. For six months, the last six months of last year, we were really, really hard. Yeah, but I was having a rest. See, because I've got a six-year-old. <laughs> right. So going on tour for me is having oh, a I rest. See. I'm okay. not going to, I'm never going to collapse on a yeah. tour from nervous exhaustion. <laughs> <laughs> I might do that at home. <laughs> I like working. I like doing the live stuff, you know. Making, making CDs that is, I'm not really involved in until it comes to the vocal side of things. So... Uh, the live thing is my sort of thing and I really, really enjoy it. I, I don't think there's very much better than actually seeing a crowd out there singing along to your songs and, you mm -hmm. know, I've paid money to see you. I think it's... Uh, and we always put a big effort into it um, 
you know, the stage set and everything like that, really try and make it worthwhile for people to come a again and again. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. we do have a, the secret's massive, which is like, um, that follow us around to loads and loads of places. Mm -hmm. So we never sort of want to dupli duplicate each year exactly what we've done the previous time. Right. So we do make a big effort about it. Susan, Joanna, Philip, thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Phil, if we can go back to the mid 70s and you're working in a hospital um, and you've been to school with Martin. Yeah. What was your impression of that guy when you were at school together? I think that I, I thought we were both sort of bozo y, sort of mid level people. We quite liked music, but we weren't. We weren't really stand out, we weren't the sportsmen, we weren't the geniuses or anything like that. Martin was very, very funny, but I think maybe I didn't work that out till afterwards. Martin Ware is one of the funniest guys I have met in my life. If you go out, get a chance to go out and have a drink with Martin, just go, because you're going to laugh all night. He's brilliant. Right. And I read somewhere that it was David Bowie and Roxy Music that got you through your adolescence. So you're yeah. obviously a music head, weren't you, in those days, yeah? I, well, I was into music because I've got older brothers, much older brothers, three of them, who like would turn up with the first Bob Dylan album when it came out, or the, the first Led Zeppelin album, one brother was really into the blues. And music was almost like the whole, it was everything that I was interested in. I loved quite esoteric kinds of music, and, and a lot of continuous sort of music, so your Tangerine Dreams and your, your Terry Riley was a big thing. But I also really liked pop music. Mm -hmm. And often I, I felt like a, the privilege of watching ABBA get better and better. I was working as a hospital porter at the time, but I worked the switchboard some of the time and there were free, there weren't free lines, there were lines that were free to me because I was on a switchboard, but you could ring up and hear the latest hits. And every time a new ABBA record came out and, and you'd go, <gasps> Wow, Mamma Mia is even better than the last one. Right. So I, I always was attached to that. To pop music, good yeah. pop music. Yeah. And one of the one of the very key things in that, talking about Martin Way, it's funny that I only I only feel like I knew him after school, but a, a really key moment was Martin Ware saying to me once, I like Slade, because we were at a school where you were supposed to like progressive music, you're supposed to like Blood, Sweat and Tears and Chicago and The Flock and people like that and you, you didn't get caught listening to Motown or any pop and I just remember Martin saying, I like Slade, I think Cause I Love You is a really good record and I said, you're not supposed to say that, but you're right, you're right, they're making great records. But you also were into prog rock, yeah, Roxy Music, oh, yeah. E Eno was very much a kind of forerunner of what you, you were doing in a certain way. Well, with prog bass, I now, I now say that now that prog is, is trendy again, but that, that was really what we were into. We really liked The Nice, for instance. We really liked Yes, uh, King Crimson. Mm -hmm. prog, prog was great. Uh, when it came to actually joining the future, as it was at that point, they, they were, Martin and Ian were dead daughters, weren't they, originally? They got... Martin and Ian had been in musical vomit, and then they were the dead daughters. There was another one I was talking to someone about the other day, but I can't remember what it was. Right, yeah, right. They'd, right. Been, they'd been around doing stuff. You didn't have any sort of ambitions in that direction, really, did you? No, I always thought people, people in groups, they had to, they had to look stupid. My, my, you know, it's like, I always really liked the Rolling Stones, but I thought that, that Mick Jagger looked like an idiot on stage. You know, I just didn't know why he was doing all that, all that jumping around stuff, mm -hmm. really. So that, that was good for me. I could settle back. I think I had vague ambitions to maybe try and write books or something. My dad always thought I was, I was going to be a novelist. Right. But that enabled me also to be um, unbiased about Martin and Ian. They'd been doing some tapes with Addie Newton as the future. Mm -hmm. And whereas everyone else we knew was in groups, they, they always wanted to be the Sex Pistols, everyone wanted to be the Sex Pistols. Mm -hmm. So they had to say, well, your stuff's all right, but it's not as good as what I would be doing, or you're doing all that wrong. Because I had no ambitions, I could just say, well, lads, your tapes are fantastic. You, you sound really, really good. I think, I think mm -hmm. you've got a big future, you're wonderful. Mm -hmm. And that makes you look good to people. And when Addie left, you basically joined permanently then, is that the case? I joined, they, uh, Addie left, they were looking around for someone else, and it would have been Glenn, 
but Glenn was working, I think he was um, learning photography. I can't remember if he was at college, but he was in London, on a phot on, I think on a photography course. Otherwise it would have been Glenn because he was, he was closer to them than I was. Glenn had, had been in the theatre group and everything. All right. When it came to Human League and actually doing your first gig, which was at Sheffield Arts Art College. Salt Lane Art College, yeah. I read that you the first gig, you started the gig with a tape recorder on its own in the middle of the floor, no yeah. people. Yeah. So you, you had a very advanced idea about what gigs were going to be with Human League. It was not going to be what everybody else is used to. Well, there was quite a little movement going on. I actually had never seen Cabaret Voltaire, for instance, before I was in the group, I don't think. And, but they were working in a very similar area because... In those days, synthesizers were monophonic. You could get one sound out of them at once, and that, that was it. So if you've got two guys with synths, it's going to be pretty thin. Mm -hmm. So we would put the percussion bits, because we were doing them ourselves, they would end up on the tape. Right. Now, a point that Martin made about Human League uh, of the future at that point, and Sheffield, he said that Sheffield is a city of sounds, you know, music concrete. It's a city where... You got drop forges yeah. and, and, and that whole thing. Yeah. Kraftwerk were from Dusseldorf, weren't yes. they? which is again steel, steel yes. town, isn't it? Do you see Sheffield very much in your early music? Was was Sheffield the environment very much in your music? I think I think it probably was. I think I would have denied that for years and years. But people grow up having that pressed on them. And the fact was to get to the motorway in Sheffield at that stage, you had to go down ridiculous sort sort of rows of factories that you'd look in and there were showers of sparks coming out from the steel industry. Mm -hmm. And like Barry Gordy said that, that Tamla could, could only have come out of Detroit because it's the sound of machines making cars. Right. Maybe that's true and we sounded like that because of Sheffield. Right. How did it feel when you were assigned to a major? Because I understand that you had a grave suspicion of record companies in the early days. So when, when the deal came with Virgin, was that good news for, for you, Phil Oakey? No, I think we were all really worried about joining a major. Um, we were very proud of being a little cottage industry. We were all a load of lefties. We're suspicious. As soon as a business gets bigger and bigger, we get more and more suspicious of it. We all really believed in the ethos of punk, where you had to beat the majors on your own terms, even though everyone did did sign to majors. Uh, and yeah, we were we were worried about it. That was our manager Bob Last's idea. Mm -hmm. As soon as he saw the chance of signing to Virgin, he was going to do it. Mm -hmm. But he, he was very clever with money. Right. Were you pleased with those first two albums, Reproduction and Travelogue? I loved the songs on Reproduction, but I don't know how we made quite such a mess of the recording, which I more or less had worked out by the time we came home. We recorded that album in two weeks, with the weekend off, mixed and everything. Down in London? Yeah, right. at Red Bus Studios. And as we were coming back on the train, I, I remember saying something like, I'm not sure this is as good as it could be. And it was, it was like we'd had great tunes that Martin and Ian had written. They did all the instrumental stuff. Stuff like Blind Youth that we were doing a show and people who'd never heard the song before, by the end, were screaming and singing it be because they'd written such a good song. And we buried the good tunes. Right. Somehow, in a slick production, we, we threw our, our good material away. Mm -hmm. So I was really glad that for the album after that, we spent the money on buying recording equipment and we made it ourselves with uh, a very good engineer in Sheffield mm -hmm. on, on an 8-track, and I feel very, very proud of Travelogue. When it came to Travelogue comes out, what, at what point during 1980, Phil, did you sense that you know the Martin... Ian split was going to come. Well, it came. The split with with Martin and Ian came out of the blue. That I know the mechanics of it were that we arranged to do a photo session, which I considered important. So I made a big effort and you know got my makeup on and everything. And Martin didn't turn up. So I was a little bit upset about it. Mm. And I remember saying to our manager Bob, "Well, look, we've got to have a meeting and sort this out. I don't want to put the effort in and and then have it have it wasted." And, and then we didn't, we called the meeting and Martin didn't come to that either, uh, which was quite clever in a way. Um, and, and I heard on the grapevine that Martin said he would never appear on a stage with me again. But I think he said that because it, it's what um, 
Brian Ferry said about Brian Eno, and right. he just he wanted to be part of the run of things, which which is you know nice Martin reference back. Yeah, and, but and there, there with Brian Ferry and Brian Eno, it was Brian Eno's chaos, wasn't it, against Brian Ferry's control freak? Then was that a similar situation with you? I think I think both myself and Martin are pretty chaotic. In in in, I think we we might be quite similar actually right. in in our musical th- sort of things. We liked the same sort of things. Did you like what he went, wanted to do with M17? I felt that they lost the idea that that I'm quite, if not simple, I am single-minded, uh, divergent, uh, convergent rather than divergent, and and what would be a, a, a failing in any in anything else in an artistic endeavour can be can be quite good, and I more or less knew exactly where we should go. I have the ability to not take my eyes off the prize. Whereas they went off and they were suddenly going, well, should we bring a bass player in? Well, maybe. Should we bring a... We've got a really good singer in Glenn, but should we have some of the singers as well? And it, it all got a bit unfocused. Mm-hmm. Whereas I knew exactly what, what, what we should stick to. So when the split came, Phil, you, you did have a vision when you went to Daisy's Disco, you know, you did have a vision of what the next stage was going to be, or did you panic for a while? Or Real panic. I mean, real, real competitive um, stuff. I, I thought that we would, we would look like idiots, and everyone said we were going to be idiots. The articles just said that Martin Ian were the talented ones and they had left. Right. Um, but I, I just I had this vision of, of an accessible sort of synth music, and not, not doing anything that might confuse people so much that they wouldn't be able to go in the shop and buy it. Right mm-hmm. down to the, to the fact that I'd, I'd actually started growing my hair cut before, before I joined the group, but it added that people could go in, a, go in a record shop and say, well, I want that record by the guy with the funny haircut. They, it, you know, yeah. they, never, they never had to, like Kajagoogoo came out mm-hmm. and it was like embarrassing for people to go in the shop and say, I want a Kajagoogoo mm-hmm. record. And, and I wanted us to not do any of that. I mm. wanted people to just go, if they like the music, they could buy it, they could identify it and get it. When it came to the videos that Human League made, were you very much the ideas man there or was there a producer aside? We weren't very much to do with the videos. and The more we did, I think the worse they were. Adrian had some input because he was very friendly with Steve Barron, who made our sort of more memorable early videos. But really, the problem is that although you, you may spend 150,000 or 200,000 pounds making an LP, that's done over a six month or a year period, and you can work for a week in the wrong direction and go, whoops, we've done it wrong, we'll wipe those tapes and restart. With a video, especially around that period when they started getting really expensive, you would be spending 90,000 pounds in two days. And if you got confused while you were doing that, you had a real problem. You'd wasted half the budget of of your album. So the best thing to do was to get a professional and let them do it. Right, right. And what we were talking about earlier, the dare, was that part of your vision or did dare come together? Susan was making the point that things just came together like of their own accord in a certain way. They just happened as they happened to happen. Yeah. Did Could you see when, you know, it's quite an amazing sort of story from overnight success in a sense, isn't it? That, that, that you, you spot these two la- la- young la- ladies in a disco in November and the following Christmas you rule the world. It's, it's not an exaggeration, is it? Could you, could you see that, would, did you feel it in your waters as it were? I don't think we, we ever really knew what was happening. And, and it's almost like Joan and Susan were the symbols and had their very important part. But at the same time, we started working with Ian Burden, mm-hmm. who, who did the majority of the work on the first two successful singles. So he, was, yeah. he was very important to us. We met Martin Rushant, who, although a, a terrific producer, had been a drummer in his time. And, and we started working with Joe Callis, who was the guitar player in the Rosillos. Mm-hmm. And suddenly, we more or less had a conventional band using unconventional instruments. We had a bass player, a chord player, and a drummer. And the bassist was solidly there. Mm-hmm. Then we, we sort of took on the the using, using public avenues of, of media and things to, to make ourselves memorable, which, which myself and John and Susan could cope with. Yeah. And, and it all just came together. Right, right. 
and working with Giorgio Moroder must have been heaven for you. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, I, I, working with Giorgio is something that you couldn't turn down. Although it was one of those very rushed things. I think the hum we were touring, the league were touring, and we had a couple of days off. And I had a, a, like a week to write some lyrics, and, and I think we recorded all, all the stuff in a couple of days. Right. And maybe we should have put more thought into it, but we, we, just, we just threw it down. All right. Bringing us up to the present, Phil, got to ask a question about the car commercial. Right. How did that come about? Well, these things just happen now. Now that I think now that we're sort of acceptable and, and we even have a couple of classic tracks, luckily, behind us, just I get, I get letters from the people at, at, at uh, EMI Music, for instance, or Virgin Records around the world, and they, they just come up, came up with this. So we would like you, to use your, your most important track for, for a car advert. But Don't You Want Me Baby was such a classic of its time. Do you like that? Did you, did you know what kind of treatment they were going to do with this commercial? Or? Well, we do get a treatment at the, at the same time. I mean, I would have just stopped it anyway because I didn't think they got enough money. And, you know, I've been in the business long enough to, to, to look at a track and, and go, well, I, I know how much that track's worth, that one day someone's going to pay this money. And the more you give it to crummy people in the meantime, the less, the less you're going to get that. Mm -hmm. So I was turning everything down until the magic figure which I hold in my head turned up. So I said no, and they came back and said, we've looked at the contract and you have to do it. We're just, we're just, tell, we're just telling you out of politeness. So it happened. Did you like the commercial? I didn't at first, although a lot of my friends who, who could take a, a, a step back said it was funny. And I, I think, well, fair enough. I'm overprecious about our stuff. Mm. The stuff is 20 years old. The, you know, Fiat aren't going to spoil people's memory of Don't You Want Me Now. They're either gonna, they've decided whether they like it or not. Mm -hmm. And right, well, not right up to the present, but we were just uh, with, with Susan and Joanne, we were talking about uh, Secrets being a very enjoyable album for you. Yeah. You, as a musician, you're still obviously wanting to sort of keep on going in the studio. What are you up to? What have you been up to in the last year? What's your plans for this year, studio-wise? I'm not. I'm trying not to do anything at all at the moment. Like I say, we worked really hard for six months of last year. Um, because we were rushed, we didn't work out the set properly. So I wore my voice out. I lost my voice on stage every night in America. It was all right in Australia because we had the, the shorter set with bigger breaks. But but that sort of ground me down. And I thought I'm doing all right at the moment. I'm going to take. Well, it was going to be a month off, but it's just sort of expanded to uh, three months. There's, there are things out now with, with me on them. Uh, Kings Have Long Arms have got a single that, that's done very well. But it's more that I, I go out in Sheffield and I drink quite a lot. And, and then I bump into someone in a group and they say, oh, come and sing on our record. And I go, yeah, you're all right, I'll do that, yeah, okay. And, and I go and do that. Yeah. Whereas I should get a little card out of my pocket that says, I want half the writing, I want to earn some money. Right. So I'm, 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 I've got a few ideas going. Uh, and I'm not going to do it until I've got my house fixed up. Right. And how many, how many sort of years ahead, difficult question this, to the next album? You were being very sort of uh, guarded about it, but there, there's got to be another album. I don't even know if there has. No? Well, I mean, the idea of the Human League that, that finally got into our head was that we get a record company to give us quite a substantial sum of money, and then we think about making a record. The state of the pop industry is is now that that is not going to happen again. Mm -hmm. So we have to have to think of a whole new mode mm -hmm. of doing it. Um, I have got old and soft and lazy, and the idea of going out and really, really working hard doesn't appeal to me as much, right. which is, I think, what people have to do now, to record it all yourself, and then to either distribute it on CD, which isn't gonna last much longer anyway, or get it on the internet and be, dealing with how to get the money from people and things doesn't appeal to me that much. Are you flattered by the, you know, the dance mixes of Don't You Want Me Baby or, or are you flattered by the, all that thing that, you know, people have taken your music, brought it right into the present and, and it's still sort of going on? Is that must be a very good feeling. I, I've, I've just, I've loved being part of music and in the same way that, that when we did all right, I, I hope I was a bit big-headed for a little while, but I thought it, saw it as just another, another part of what had inspired me that I got through my adolescence. Mm -hmm. 
via the Lou Reeds and the Iggy Pops and the David Bowies and the Yeses. And it was wonderful to, to just be a little part of that just for a little time mm -hmm. is great. And that on the way, you know, maybe there wouldn't have been a KLF if there hadn't been a Human League. Mm -hmm. Maybe there wouldn't have been a Soul to Soul. Mm -hmm. So that was part of it. And I, I love it when people go and, and refer to the stuff, you know, what Richard X does or something, and, and make people think about what we did again, which was really nice. Mm -hmm. But but it's it's just that joy that the the thing I was really bothered about I've worked at for my whole life, mm. which which is so, so lucky. All I've ever done is is try and make records, right. and it's brilliant. Thanks for your time. Cheers.